So right now, our imaginary patient, as you can see, is a five foot seven inch male um, there on the display. And we're ventilating him with a tidal volume of 460 cc's and a breath rate of 15. So that is delivering, as you can see here, a 7.13 milliliter per kilo of ideal body weight tidal volume. And we're delivering 100 mils per minute per kilo of minute ventilation. So we've got a normal minute ventilation for this patient who's not breathing right now. We'll keep it simple. I'm not breathing right now. And we've got right in the middle of the quote unquote lung protective uh, range of tidal volumes. If the patient's lung gets stiffer, and I'll compress the, the test lung a little bit, you'll see the peak airway pressures will go up to continue to deliver that 460 cc's. So the patient's minute ventilation is going to stay constant, but you can see the peak pressures are going up substantially. If the patient's lung uh, suddenly becomes more compliant, and I'll release the compression of the lung, you'll see the pressures fall back down. So volume assist control is maintaining that tidal volume, but it's using a lot of pressure in this particular case to do it, and we're still at that rate of 15. And when you think about how most people manage a ventilator, they don't make multiple changes simultaneously that often. You know, if somebody needs to adjust, the tidal volume and the breath rate isn't as common as adjusting one or the other, especially in the in the place of carbon dioxide where they may just adjust the rate. So volume control ventilation does what we would expect most basic modes of ventilation to do, but AVM's going to do it a little bit different. So we're going to take this same 5 foot 7 inch male and we're going to switch them to AVM. Now, when I touch the AVM mode, you can see all my proposed settings. Five foot seven inch male, you have to have the gender and height in so that it can determine the ideal body weight. And the ideal body weight in this uh, case has it at 100% minute volume targeting 6.6 .6 liters per minute of tidal volume, or I'm sorry, of minute ventilation. And as you see, I cannot change that minute ventilation. It is determined by the height and gender of the patient. So we'll leave them at the five foot seven because that's what we had before. We have expiratory trigger in auto. So if the patient wakes up and starts breathing, they'll have expiratory synchrony. That's something that wouldn't be available in volume assist control. <clears throat> and we'll hit apply. We do and we jump back out to the cockpit screen. The first thing you'll notice is the waveform has changed because the ventilator is no longer doing a decelerating flow volume control breath, it's now a pressure control breath type, which is a decelerating flow um, like you would have with pressure assist control, um, very much like a PRVC breath. So it's adjusting the inspiratory pressure to hit the target tidal volume, which in this case is 349 mils, unlike the 460 that we had before. <clears throat> and as you can see, that's producing a tidal volume of just below six cc's per kilo of ideal body weight. So it's at the lower end of the tidal volume range. And it picked up some on the rate from 15 to 19. The peak airway pressure actually came down a little bit because tidal volume is lower. The mean is stable to slightly higher because the breath rate is up a little bit. But it's essentially doing the same thing. It's providing the same minute ventilation that we had before, but it's doing it with less pressure and a lower tidal volume. If you look at this lower graph, you'll see this box um, with the blue sphere in it. And if I compress the lung a little bit to decrease the compliance, you'll see the blue sphere fall off. And then the ventilator will start increasing pressure to bring that blue sphere up to the white spot on that line, which is the target. And you'll notice that box is changing around it, which is sort of the operational envelope for the ventilator. One of the controls that I didn't talk about yet um, is over here, the pressure limit. So right now it's at 30. So when we look over here, you can see the upper limit of that box goes up to somewhere around 1300 cc's. But 
the pressure limit's pretty excessive for where we're ventilating the patient right now. So if we drop that down to something maybe around 18, <clears throat> and we go back out here, you'll see that box shrinks down. So make sure that the pressure limit's set appropriately. Otherwise, that big wide box kind of scares uh, the customers. And it's impacted by the compliance of the lung and some other things that go on as well. But that little blue sphere shows you where you are relative to the target. So I just squeeze the lung again, which is why it's dropping down. You can see the peak pressure going up because it wants to get back on target. Because I suddenly release the lung, it overshot, and so it's going to walk back down. So that's what the ventilator is doing. It's trying to use this low amount of power to ventilate the patient. We're maintaining the same minute ventilation we had before, but you can see as I've manipulated the test lung, either making it worse or making it better, the ventilator flies the patient right back onto the target. I'm going to do something more significant in a minute. I'm going to significantly change the compliance of the lung. So if you watch, I'm going to reduce the lung compliance. I'm going to cut it pretty much in half. So now, um, that was me squeezing the lung, but uh, I've slid the clip up on the lung, and I cut the compliance of the lung in half, and what you see is that box sort of readjusting. But this expiratory time constant that was um, over 0.4 seconds, this one right here, this 0.27, shortened because the lung is so stiff that it can empty very quickly. And the algorithm is monitoring that. And since it knows that the lung can empty more quickly, it increased the rate just by one or two, just a little bit. But it brought the tidal volume down, again, maintaining the same target minute ventilation so that the patient's carbon dioxide level remains under control. And it did that by monitoring that expiratory time constant. It wants to give at least three times the, the time constant um, to ensure that the patient has adequate time to exhale. So as the device stabilizes again, you can see we're right around that 100 mils per minute per kilo of minute ventilation. And the patient got worse, but the ventilator responded. If the patient gets better, and we'll put the lung compliance back to where it was before, <clears throat> you'll see that tidal volume will go up initially. The ventilator will start decreasing the inspiratory pressure down to a target to keep the minute ventilation at that 100 mils per minute per kilo. So since the ventilator is doing all this, it begs the question of, well, how do I wean the patient? Well, if you think about that pre patient that was in pressure assist control, if we wanted to wean them, we'd probably decrease their rate, although they're in pressure assist control. So as long as they were breathing faster than the rate, they wouldn't even know that we'd wean the rate. Most likely, we'd have to switch them to a different mode of ventilation like um, pressure support, and that would allow us to control the supportive rate make it more apparent to the patient and um, decrease the inspiratory level of support. Well, AVM can do that simply by decreasing the percent support. So if we're out here on the cockpit screen, and you can see we're back pretty much on our target, and let's say the patient's CO2 level is low and we want to start weaning, we can drop that. So since the ventilator's targeting 100 cc's per kilo of ideal body weight, what do you think this number in the expired minute uh, volume per kilo is going to go down to? If we set it at 90, it's going to go down to 90. If we set it at 75, well, now we've reduced the support by 25%, and that number is going to go down to 75. So it's very predictable in weaning the patient from the ventilator. And if you haven't done so already in Chapter 8, Section 8.2.3, or I'm sorry, 8.23 is the section on AVM. And there is a really nice 
flow chart on weaning AVM on page 87. And this section of the manual is probably one of the best sections of the entire manual. If you haven't read it, I would encourage you to read it many, many times. I know I have. Maybe even print out page 87 when you're in institutions doing evaluations. It's a handy guide. You don't try to wean it down to 10%. You really don't want to go much below about 70% because if you think about it, if something were to uh, come up with the patient, that means that their level of support would only be 70% of, if this was at 70, um, would only be 70% of a normal minute ventilation. So their carbon dioxide level could go relatively high. So be aware of that. You can see I have vent summary up available at the top. If, um, if you have vent summary up, and if the patient's agreeable, you can just see that it went from red to yellow on spontaneous breathing. So you can still use vent summary even with AVM. So it's really kind of neat in weaning because probably many of you remember from your early years of training that you can calculate uh, what level of minute ventilation you need to, to deliver a specific CO2 for a patient. So adjusting it as a percent of minute ventilation uh, it's really super simple and easy. I kind of like that. What happens if you have the patient on 100% support and their carbon dioxide level is high? And you've you know done all the things that you need to do. The patient's not having bronchospasm. Their uh, fluid volume is good. They're, they don't need to be suctioned or anything. So you're going to increase the level of support. And normally... Most people would do that by cranking up the rate or I'm, you know, to just increase the minute ventilation. Well, in AVM, if you increase the support, the ventilator, again, is going to optimize both the, the rate and tidal volume for what you're trying to achieve. So you can see in this case, the breath rate went up a little bit and the tidal volume went up a little bit, so it's now 5.7 call it in 21 to achieve that 20% increase in minute ventilation. So you can increase it. Now you can increase it a lot. You probably don't need to do that. Um, it would be very unusual to have to go up to what this scale is capable of. Um, but it is there and that's how you increase the level, level of support. So you can see when you break it down into those three goals that we're trying to do with lung protection, adequate lung recruitment, and adequate minute ventilation. AVM is doing all of this, and it's doing it in a way that's pretty straightforward and simple for the clinician to deal with, because once you get the patient on it, it's a matter of manipulating PEEP, FiO2, and uh, the percent of support, whether you're weaning or increasing support. 